Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Something special is happening. You are invited to join us on Saturday, July 13th for a live podcast recording, Jung's American Muse, Christiana Morgan's Visions and Art. Our guest will be Christiana Morgan's granddaughter, the filmmaker Hilary Morgan. Hilary will share intimate memories of her grandmother, who, as a gifted and beautiful young artist, was one of the most important women to shape Jung's ideas of the feminine principle in psychology. Her visions and art illuminated the unconscious in ways he had never imagined. Together, we'll watch Hillary's extraordinary documentary, Tower of Dreams, and after our discussion, the audience can ask questions. Click the link below to purchase your ticket at the small cost of $5. We hope to see every one of you there. Well, hello, listeners. Uh, Some of you may know we have recently done a makeover on our Patreon. (laughs) There's lots of new content and ways to engage with us. And patrons who support us at the $5 a month level and up will now access Young Love, weekly bonus episodes where the three of us discuss dreams and questions sent in by patrons. And at the $10 level, you can also vote on podcast episode topics. And uh, we have one of those for you today. So we recently ran our first ever poll, (laughs) and the winner was self-sabotage, which will be our topic today. So if you would like to vote on future episodes or on guests that we might invite, if you, at a higher level, you also get access to behind-the-scenes content and even occasional live events, check out our Patreon. The link is in the show notes. And thank you so much for supporters. Uh, We couldn't do it without you. So let's move on and talk about self-sabotage. Well, I would like to start with uh, what I thought was so interesting, which is just what is sabotage? And as it turns out, it comes from uh, a French word um, from some centuries back of uh, saboteur, which comes from the word sabot, which were wooden shoes that were allegedly thrown by laborers uh, who had labor disputes um, and thrown into the machinery and uh, thus interrupting and interfering with the work to be done. But who could tell who had thrown the shoes? (laughs) Except maybe the person missing shoe. (laughs) They're wooden shoes, and uh, everyone would be able to say, well, I didn't do it. Uh, So that leads to saboteur, which is a kind of uh, protest, but it's subverted. It's on the sly. It's beneath consciousness, you know, from a psychological point of view, that we don't really know we're doing it. So we are sabotaging ourselves, uh, not factory management. And uh, the inner world is concealed from us until and unless we notice that, oh my gosh, I did it again. (laughs) I was late to class again. Um, I wasn't prepared for the pop quiz again. So something is trying to get our attention. So I think that um, there's so many different angles to approach this. I mean, mm-hmm. one is just very pragmatic or, and even very modern. I think that Jung might have something different to say about the, the fateful mistakes and the things that cross our path that thwart the ego's intention. Yes. 
I think that the complex is, of course, Jung's great discovery of what thwarts the ego's functioning. So there's so many, so many things that can get in the way of the ego's intentionality. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that makes self-sabotage such a complicated topic that the symptom of self-sabotage can have so many different causes mm-hmm. as we kind of sift down, uh, some being more pathologic than others. Deb, I really liked the word you use, protest. And I, and I, you know, and it kind of ties it with the wonderful etymology of this word, workers throwing their sabot into the machinery to, to stop, stop the, stop the work, stop up the works. Because I think that self-sabotage can be seen as a kind of protest from some part of us Mm -hmm. that doesn't agree to go along with what the ego wants or what Mm -hmm. the ego thinks it wants. Uh, So, you know, in a sense, what we're talking about in self-sabotage is kind of the definition of neurosis, where our ego wants one outcome, but some other part of us clearly wants a different outcome. And we can see that in the word association experiment, you know, where, uh, you know, we've talked about this before on the podcast, but this was something that Jung innovated uh, in the early uh, years of the 20th century, where he would give a stimulus word to someone. He might say table, for example, and then the person was supposed to come up with a first word that comes into their mind. So you might say chair. And if the word comes easily and it makes sense, then it's a kind of conflict-free area. But the inner conflicts that, as you pointed out, Deb, we might be unaware of, would manifest themselves mm-hmm. in, uh, for example, if, if you said bed and and let's say the person had a kind of inner conflict around sexuality or intimacy or something like that they might they might stumble they might take longer they might laugh a little bit bizarrely they might mm-hmm. come up with a a very odd uh kind of um response word like they might say something like um sad or something like that which doesn't really make any sense on the surface Underneath, it might make a lot of sense, but it, we, it's revealing these areas in, in our conflict. And we can think about self sabotage as a sign that there's an inner conflict, that some part of us is not, go, is not in alignment with the ego attitude. And I like what you said about what consciousness wants or thinks it wants. Uh, and so underneath that is buried our famous word, should. I really should get to bed at a reasonable hour, and I should um, floss my teeth every day. And there are a whole list of things that we agree are good things, worthwhile things. And some part of us says, hell no, I won't go. I don't want, I don't really want to do that. It is not in alignment with my desire. And until we can have that conversation with ourselves or with the help of somebody else like a therapist, uh the dynamic may may continue. It doesn't mean that what the unconscious wants is absolutely right or you know, the quote answer. Um, but at least we need to have that conversation between consciousness and unconscious. Well, I think that the unconscious, on one level, we can think of as a kind of tape recorder, mm-hmm. that it's the impression making machine inside of us. So when we receive certain kinds of messages, they just feed back to us. And just because it comes out of the unconscious doesn't mean it's been vetted or well thought, or moral, (laughs) necessarily, (laughs) the unconscious echoes back to us. And then, of course, there are other factors in the unconscious, like the self and other other forces that are seeking to move us forward in evolution. But breaking it down into this uh, more problematic part of the unconscious, I was thinking about the internalized negative beliefs about ourselves. And and that many of us have mm-hmm. uh, find when we look inside 
a lot of uh, critical terms, a, a feeling of being unworthy or a feeling mm-hmm. of being incompetent. And those things are often rooted in early childhood experiences. And one of the ways to understand that is that when we are in a very fraught relationship in our early childhood, fraught with our parents, and the parents are doing things that leave the child feeling very uncomfortable, there is a primary drive inside of the child to protect the goodness of the parent. And so the child will then take upon themselves the negative qualities and the problems in the relationship with the parent. And so mom can't be the one who's doing something wrong, so it must be that I'm the one doing something wrong. Dad must be right in him yelling at me for one thing or another, so I must be stupid or foolish, or clumsy, or wrong. And so strangely enough, as an adult, we can cling to these feelings of being incompetent, stupid, clumsy, oafish, Mm. unable, wrong. And when we begin to challenge some of those assumptions, there is a feeling that we are violating something in a very dangerous way. Mm -hmm. Because the edict in the childhood is the other person must be seen as good and even perfect so that I can maintain a survival relationship with them. So we take into ourselves these very dark and negative attitudes about about ourselves, and then we seek to reconfirm them out in the world. So I can't display my competence fully. I have to be somewhat oafish. I have to prove over and again that it is true that I am these negative qualities. Because if I don't, then like Pandora's box, that negativity sprays out into the environment and begins to populate my other relationships. And that um, is incredibly disturbing to the inner child. I, I think that is one scenario. And as yeah, you said before, one. Joseph, there are, yeah. there are so many. And I, you know, maybe I'm a little sensitive to that narrative because I am a parent. But, but I think the idea that everything has an antecedent in early childhood and our parents didn't treat us just exactly right doesn't, doesn't really, you know, it, it, it's certainly true sometimes, um, but, but it, isn't, it isn't always true. And we know now that when parents are kind of always giving their kids praise and uh, heaping up uh, all kinds of uh, positive sentiments on them and giving them participation trophies, that that also <laughs> can set someone up for self-sabotage, actually, because the person is, is fragile or may feel the weight of these expectations, may not feel comfortable failing or being less than perfect because they've always been told they're perfect. So I don't know, maybe as a parent, you know, Jim Hollis says, has this great thing that he says that, you know, life is traumatic and your parents either make it a little less so or a little more so. And, then, you know, I, I think... But we're talking about on, a on pathologic yeah. situation yeah. where... yes. We all have yes. good enough parents because yeah. we make it to adulthood. But if somebody is listening to this and saying, I self-sabotage myself all the time yes. and more than most other people, right? then there's something going on in part with childhood and many other domains yeah. that is kind of extraordinarily problematic. And I, I, I That's absolutely, more what we're talking yeah, about, yes, not the think, average parent. Yes, right. Yeah. I think, I yeah. think that's a, that's a great clarification, but the situation you described is, is a very uh, potent one that does apply to, to many people. So uh, I think it's, it's good that it's on the table. I think um, w- one of the things that I, w- I want to sort of bring our attention to a little bit, and, and Deb, you, you sort of were in this direction, I think is, Often self-sabotage has to do with adaptation. Yep. It, it has to do with whether or not we are meeting expectations in the outer world. Yeah. So self-sabotage often occurs in the domain of school, 
or or work location. It can also happen in terms of relationships. So we might uh, sabotage ourselves in terms of getting into a healthy relationship because we always do something to mess it up or we pick the wrong person or whatever. But I think those are the major domains. And it has to do then often with real first half of life stuff. Yes. Are we getting out there in the world and doing the things, you know, love and work, as Freud said, that, uh, you know, that we need, we need to do. Yeah. Uh, I think that's such a good point that um, we have to adapt to the world. Uh, and you know, Jung called this the collision with reality. You know, we, we all get to that place sooner or later that, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, whatever happened in the past or the exigencies that are operating in your current life, you have to show up for work on time. Uh, that, that's it, uh, open and shut. And I think one of the things that happens a lot, um, especially because this is first half of life, so people are by definition still growing and maturing, is uh, things get externalized. Um, it's not my fault because... I, I, just, I don't have enough time. Um, I don't have enough money. Uh, the, the bus is always late, and I don't have a car, so I have to take the bus. And as um, many of our listeners know, I started out my uh, professional life as a special ed teacher working with adolescents. And uh, one of the things I learned was a lot of uh, new profanities and ways to combine them. And especially picturesque ways, which was, I kind of appreciated that. But um, that there were uh, these kinds of difficulties for, for students, uh, including with their own uh, learning disabilities, uh, the bus could be late, uh, a hundred other things. But where and when, and it was our part of our job, does that young person learn to say, I I'm just really scared of this. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that I'm going to try and I'm going to fail anyway. And it had, in a way, um, you know, whether that, that particular student passed history or any other class, you know, really was symbolic of uh, having enough ego strength to say, I can show up for this. I dare to show up for the hard thing where I really believe the teacher dislikes me. I have difficulty reading. Uh, this is so not my thing. But, but I can show up. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, a huge transition. And I think is part of everyone's uh, maturation. Mm -hmm. One way or another, we all have a collision with reality. Hopefully. One way Hope that we can <laughs> <laughs> categorize that is distress tolerance. Mm -hmm. Yep. That um, the yes. teacher I don't think likes me and that's distressing. And can I tolerate being distressed and take mm -hmm. the test? Or um, I'm not sure I'll make this job. Maybe I'll be embarrassed. Can I? And I tolerate the distress right. of one thing or another. And yes. for some of us, distress tolerance is very, very difficult. Uh, part of that could even be neurologic, mm -hmm. this idea of the highly sensitive person. But often, as we were saying before, yeah. it's neurotic, that yeah. there's mm -hmm. a self-perception yes. that I couldn't possibly tolerate it. And the phrase, which is so painful when I hear it from anybody, is, I can't take it. Mm. I just can't take one more minute of hearing the customer say thus and such. I just can't take one more rejection. I can't, I can't take it, mm -hmm. which is such an interesting phrase, right? Yes. Yeah. What does that mean? Right. And, <laughs> and we, we can take, we can pretty much take can. most of the things that modern life at least provides to us. But once we take it into our hands or take it into the realm of experience, the question is how, how do we metabolize it? What do we do with the thing that's now in our hands versus just 
flipping our hands in the air and letting it crash to the ground. And that goes to what we were saying earlier about adaptive capacities mm -hmm. to know what to do with the thing in your mm -hmm. hand. I wanted to also circle around to something that I know shows up a lot in the uh, public discourse is just fear of success, mm -hmm. which I think is a very tricky phrase because if we're afraid of it, it's hard to even call it success. But Yeah, that's great, <laughs> yeah. But we have a goal. Let's say instead of fear of success, we might say attaining the goal mm -hmm. um, in that regard. And one of the things that I think people rightly perceive is that we've set a goal for ourselves, and there's an idea that I could attain the goal. And as we approach the goal, we come into a greater sense of the reality of what the attainment might be, and we realize that actually achieving the goal will require things from us. Mm -hmm. And even on the most basic level, it means that there will be new responsibilities and new expectations. So let's say we have you know, the goal of buying my first house, and mm -hmm. there's the archetype of the home and everything that the family believes about how wonderful it is to buy a home. And then as we approach purchasing the home, we realize, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to pay taxes. And then I have to have a <laughs> roof on it. And then I have to learn how to fix a pipe. And then people are going to be expecting to come and visit me and stay in the house. But I'm an introvert and I don't really want anyone to visit me. Mm -hmm. Maybe that you know one room uh, efficiency I was staying in really protected me from anybody ever <laughs> intruding upon my space. So as we come towards the yeah. reality of the thing that we were sure we wanted, the success, that all yeah. the other things the rea about the responsibilities and expectations can make us ambivalent enough to want to um, pull the rug out, you know, pull, pull the stop the train mm -hmm. chain. And of course, this mm -hmm. can happen very unconsciously, so we don't mm -hmm. kind of realize that we don't really want to take on the thing we were sure we wanted. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking um, how closely what you're saying relates to imposter syndrome. Uh, you know, that we do all the things that are conventionally expected of us. You know, including to take your example, I'm going to buy my first home. But then the bar keeps getting raised. You know, it's like the goalposts keep moving. Of, now you've bought a home. Now you have to learn how to repair a pipe. Now you're prepared to host people for the weekend. So now you have to learn how to cook and prepare food for everybody, which means you have to spend more money. It's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Reality. <laughs> um. But I think it's it, it, where I'm going is the same as with uh, my high school students is, what are you afraid of? of? Let's just talk about what you're afraid of. Well, I'm afraid of all these things that go along with buying a house. Well, that makes sense. I hear you. Uh, or for, you know, one of my former students, of, I, 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 I'm afraid of, my inability to really decode all these words and understand it and organize it, I can't deal with this uh, content, and I feel like I really am stupid. Okay, now let's talk about that. And that goes back, I'm hooking this back to what you said, Lisa, about neurosis way back when, well, both of you, which is the, the, the dissonance between what consciousness feels and what our what our feeling life has to say about it, uh, the split between thinking and convention and expectations and what our feelings are. And your feelings are fine. You can feel anything you want to feel. Uh, and that doesn't have to be the basis for making the decision. Two things that you had said, Deb, I just want to lift up that are so important with working with your students is, one is, like I've mentioned a number of times, puncturing the neurotic isolation. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Getting the child to come forward and confess, like, I really, I'm scared of this, that they know yes. they're scared of it. So it is in consciousness, right? but they're holding it as such a, a secret, it becomes right. overpotent. Right. And then the stress of that can be so intense. The other thing is that, which I think we have to remind the listeners, is that when we think of self-sabotaging, for the most part, these things are functioning under the threshold yes. of consciousness. Yep. So we really are marching along towards the house closing or to the interview or getting ready mm-hmm. to write our thesis. And, yeah. uh, and it feels like some external force or some, some mysterious ghost in the works or yes. some, some ghostly worker throws the wooden mm-hmm. clog into my mm-hmm. computer and all of a sudden it won't work anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're mystified. Um, we can't really name it, at least not easily. And right. what you do with your students, which is great, Deb, is trying to pull things into consciousness so you and that right. kid can talk about it. And then, of course, right. things loosen up and change yeah. is possible. You're not supposed to be afraid of, of history class. You're not supposed to be afraid of buying your first house or writing your thesis. Uh, and so we're not supposed to be afraid of things, and we are, and it's okay. <laughs> and, and where I want to go with that is, Joseph, you brought up this great word, you know, ambivalent. And of course, as you've both just been saying, a lot of times our ambivalence is unconscious. So exactly. just as you were saying, Joseph, you don't know that there is a part of you that doesn't want what you think you want. And, uh, and that, that may be just kind of ghostly in our consciousness, just a vague awareness. But I, I think that um, ambivalence is normal. We, we've done a whole episode on ambivalence. You can go check that out. But if we don't uh, have our ambivalence in consciousness, just like you were mm-hmm. saying, Deb, it can grab us by the ankle and trip us as we're trying to move forward. So there is a real value to just getting it out there. I remember um, I went to social work school at um, New York University and our first day, this was so great. Our first day they passed around index cards and they said, write down on the card, what is the thing about social work school that you are afraid of? Mm. Wow. And you know, some people say, well, am am I going to have to go into people's homes in very poor neighborhoods or I'm going to, you know, and I thought, well, that's a great question. What am I afraid of? And mine was that I won't like it Mm. because for me it was this big gamble and this career change as part of you know hoping to become a Jungian analyst and but it was just so great to know that okay Mm -hmm. that's there for me I'm afraid of this so so I think I think there's something uh really great about that but see the thing is to risk moving forward in life we 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 have to we have to take these risks and and it's sort of like I think one way to think about self-sabotage is how comfortable it is to stay small. And oftentimes self-sabotage is in the interest of keeping us small. That's another, yeah. another possibility. It's not the only one, but it's another possibility. So Joseph, like your example with the house, like it's a big thing to become a homeowner. Oh, huge. But maybe it's safer if I stay small. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I think, you know, you were, so we're sort of talking about mm-hmm. fear as a motivator for self sabotage, and I and I think mm-hmm. that that is uh, that's a powerful one. The, again, you brush against this, Deb, which is another kind of fear, is an imposter syndrome. Um, when we're talking about the approach, when we approach the fantasy, and then we realize how complicated the expectations and responsibilities may be, or some part of the unconscious begins to chirp about the responsibilities we could be ambivalent about imposter syndrome is the fear of being a fraud. That even mm-hmm. though I've got that PhD and I've got all this uh, background, there is this inner voice that tries to convince us in some very complicated way that we really are fraudulent. Mm-hmm. And so staying small, as you were saying, Lisa, is a way of, I guess in this cognitive distortion, is a way of not being subject to the fantasy of humiliation. Mm-hmm. That really is a fantasy. Mm-hmm. But as you were talking about the word association test, we can have a humiliation complex 
maybe we saw somebody humiliated. Mm-hmm. It didn't even happen to us, but we saw some kid, I don't know, pulled up in front of the class and humiliated because they cheated on the test or did some other thing. And then we can have this expectation, well, it's just a matter of time before that happens to me. That I'll be exposed in some horrible way. And then that begins to invade areas of the inner terrain where it doesn't belong. Just as you were saying, Deb, it's, mm-hmm. we're not supposed to necessarily feel that way. Mm-hmm. But something has invaded, an atmosphere has invaded that shouldn't be there. Yeah. But there's a, there's a fear, and there's also a secret. Mm-hmm. Yes. A secret from ourselves. A secret from ourselves. But what if people find out that... I'm really not good at this. Mm-hmm. Uh, what if people find out that uh, I'm ambivalent or um, I don't like it and I'm supposed to like it? Uh, it's supposed to be great to buy your first house. It's supposed to be great to be expecting a baby. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's a big one. So. The, it's the sense that there's a fear and it's a secret and it's a secret from ourselves mm-hmm. of versus, oh, the terrible secret is that you don't really like hitting the books and studying mm-hmm. history and geography or whatever else it is. Okay. Um, what do you like? Mm-hmm. And also, how do you do the thing that the world requires of you? You don't have to like it. But yeah. it's probably a good thing to graduate from high school. Mm-hmm. You know, all in, uh, so uh, w- once the secret is out and the fear of failing, of how can you face the task that's not so terrible? And I'm going to do a pithy Jung quote here. Uh, Jung says, I no longer seek the cause of a neurosis in the past, but in the present. I ask, what is the necessary task which the patient will not accomplish? Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, that is um, all these things that you feel, and they're all legitimate. And now, what about the necessary task that that is in your interest, and that where you've been sabotaging yourself? Uh, how can we get cracking on this? Jung said that dreams are the guiding words of the soul. Dream School is our twelve-month self-paced online program that teaches you how to understand these important messages from the unconscious. We break down the essential skills teach you how to apply them, and offer opportunities for practice. You can become part of a vibrant community, join a dream group, or share your dream with other students. There are monthly live Q&As with Joseph, a chance for one-on-one time with Deb in her office hours, and monthly dream seminars with me, Lisa. Visit our website, thisjungianlife.com, to learn more or sign up. And one of the the ways into that question Ed, that you brought up so uh, well is um, what what is in the immediate environment that the symbolic attitude can also reveal that we don't always have to go into the past right mm. in order to understand something and this goes to um, something that you'd also said not in the great same terms but self handicapping mm. so the idea that we externalize the failure we, we misattribute the failure to an external factor. Yes. So, and then one way, that's called self-handicapping in a way. Yeah. But that, is, but that is a symbolic event that's happening in present time. So what is it about <laughs> the train or the schedule or the train schedule that the ego cannot orient to it means something that it is symbolic of something that's happening right here 
it just you're saying that there's a task right here in the room. Yeah. And that the inability to engage just the task of getting to the 7 a.m. train. Right. Exactly. It's its own microcosm exactly. that holds the secret yeah. right there in the room. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and this goes to taking incremental steps. So job one that is not, not going to be a killer is uh, get up a little earlier and take the earlier bus. It's, that is actually doable, and that's a step. But you, you have to have consciousness before oh, you, you can do that. I, I mean, I think, I think one of the things that's interesting here about self-sabotage is that, um, you, you know, you both were saying you don't have to look to the past, Jung's great quote. There can be a prospective function here. Because yeah. if we think about it as a split between the conscious attitude and the unconscious attitude, the self-sabotaging behaviors could be could could reveal the agenda of the unconscious, mm -hmm. and in that sense, it may be uh, moving us toward individuation. It might be that the conscious attitude, like I'm going to go to be, I'm going to go to law school and be a lawyer, but that's not really what the psyche wants of you, and so you sleep through the LSATs. You know? <laughs> And it might be that that's the Felix culpa, the happy mistake mm -hmm. that seems like self-sabotage at the time, but really it gets you on a different road that you needed to be mm -hmm. on. So, so that's where we can, like you were saying, Joseph, there's meaning in this and we can be curious about the meaning. I don't think it's always the case that, um, that, that our, our bumbles are revealing our true path. It's often a little bit more complicated than that. Joseph, if you don't mind, I'm thinking of your great story that you've told on the podcast before about your early work when you were a body worker mm -hmm. and you, you just weren't attending to things. So you started having that dream of the intruder coming up the stairs. Yes, but that was more about my business. I was not attending to my finances and how to run a business. Right. Yeah. And in that way, you were self sabotaging. Yes. Yes. One yes. could say that I was serving this. Um, Catholic poverty fantasy, yes. spirituality and poverty being woven oh. into the oh worldview. <laughs> and I was doing a very good job <laughs> at being holy in that regard. Ah. So. <laughs> so, so the, the, the tension there was that you had a, you had a kind of an unconscious allegiance to this mm -hmm. idea of holy poverty in a sense mm -hmm. that probably made you feel safe and small. I think perhaps so. Oh, I'm absolutely! By God, by not uh, yeah, not, you not didn't test the, the faith, right? By yes. being avaricious, yes. And that that is part of something that um, some of the writers call moral masochism. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think so. Uh, <laughs> <you> <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you you take the harder more difficult uh, road through the rocky terrain and the brambles um, because it is more virtuous, uh, more, more holy. And then when you don't have enough money or, you know, your old car finally breaks down, um, it's not self-sabotage. It is uh, the consequence of virtue. And I think it, that's a good really good point of the moral masochism of um, it's all to the good and I'm giving myself uh, to others of in my uh, what is it that the monks used to wear those rough cloth the hair shirt the hair shirt yeah uh, nothing like a hair shirt <laughs> <laughs> I've got several of them in my closet right now <laughs> <laughs> Psychological hair shirts. You know, yeah. here's what I, here's what, here's my salute. Here's what I here's where I think we're going. Okay, which is that when we find ourselves sabotaging ourselves, the first thing is to get curious mm -hmm. and to to wonder about what's going on. Because it might be that really psyche is saying you're not meant to be a lawyer, or it could be that you're you know staying small and safe, or it could be you know a kind of childhood trauma that you're in service to, or 
could be any number of the things that we've talked about. Um, uh, it could be just the voice of the unconscious saying, no, you know, that's, that's not my plan. So, so the first thing to do really is to have a conversation. Yes. And I think that this is really a form of active imagination. Again, we've done an, I think we've done an episode on active imagination. It was like forever ago, but I think mm-hmm. it's out there. And, and uh, you can go and have a listen to that. But, but what I would recommend is that you personify the part of you that keeps on throwing your wooden clog into the works. If you, let's say, have just found out that you're headed toward diabetes, you have whatever those elevated markers are, and you really, really need to get a hold of your eating, but you just find that you keep on reaching for the cupcakes. French fries. French fries. Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Confession. <laughs> Mine is cupcakes. Um, uh, you know, sit down and, and uh, turn off your phone, close the door, get some quiet time, make about 30 minutes in your day, and just let yourself picture who is the kid who wants the cupcake? Or maybe it's a kid, maybe it's not a kid. What part of you wants the cupcake? And then have a conversation. Say, listen, we have a problem here. I have to stop eating this, French fries, Skittles, cupcakes. <laughs> and you're really making it hard. So can, let's have a conversation and have a dialogue. And, you know, I've, uh, I've seen this really turn things around. I mean, it's not it still requires effort. It's still effortful to push yes, through things like this. But it can be so much easier when you're not on opposite teams, when you don't have, when you don't have a saboteur in your midst. Mm-hmm. You know, and you could say, look, what, what, do, what okay, you, you want to feel you know, cared for and you want to feel like you're special and you want to feel like you get a little treat. Is there another way I could do that for you? Could, could, I, could I take a 15-minute break in the middle of my work day and, take a walk and maybe, you know, buy you a, a cold seltzer, would, would that be okay? No. And- no. <laughs> Absolutely not, by the way. You try telling a six-year-old oh, come who on. wants ice cream, <laughs> would you like a delicious seltzer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's really hard. It is really hard. But, but I think imaginally engaging with the inner saboteur is really the yes. best way to move forward. No, yes. It's still not easy. It's not foolproof. It's like, Deb, what you came up with at the beginning. It's like difficult labor relation negotiations. Yes. And, 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 and the task that needs to be accomplished. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just does. There's, there's no art. That's the collision with reality is yeah. my health requires this. Um, the truth is the, the Skittles and the French fries got to go, except for very occasionally, perhaps. But the reality is the reality, and, and it may need to be mourned of, uh, boy, it's hard. It really is hard. It, um, you know, that, that Friday after work uh, burger, fries, and beer with the gang? Uh, I'm going to order what a salad. That's hard. But also the the saboteur is the one who is propping up the the fantasy that something is not true. Mm-hmm. By that mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, that I'm eating the skittles, which proves that I don't have diabetes. Yeah. And if I gave up the Skittles, then I would have to collapse and grieve, as you were saying. Yeah. Would have to grieve the fact, oh, yeah. crap, I yeah. really have yeah. diabetes. Mm-hmm. And not eating the Skittles is one of the proofs right. that I have diabetes. I can do so this. So if I attack anything that proves the reality mm-hmm. is the reality, yeah. then I can keep floating in this cloud of denial. Yeah. But the reason I can eat an entire box of cupcakes is that I don't have diabetes and I did eat it. And so therefore I have evidence. That it's really okay. That's a good. So we're, it's about, some of it is about denial. And I think there are so many ways to at least let the other side 
that has no other recourse but to be a saboteur until we let the other side have its say. Mm -hmm. And that Jung Mm -hmm. says that, that we have to let the unconscious have its full say. And so sometimes people can uh, journal. There's something about holding a pen in your hand. Uh, The eye, hand, mind, body connection can be, and let that other part say whatever it wants. Or um, the other place you can really do this is out loud in a very private place or in your car. Uh, Cars are self-enclosed little bubbles. Um, where it's pretty soundproof and you can let that part of you be angry and protest and say whatever needs to be said about, I don't like it, I don't want it, I wish I didn't have to do it. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate what you're saying, Deb, about kind of letting that part have its, because it might be, as we've been saying and you've said again and again today, it might be fear. I'm really fear. afraid. And and maybe it was a fear we didn't know we had before. Like I'm yeah. afraid of uh, I'm af- I'm afraid of what it might be like to own a house. I thought I wanted a house, but now, yeah. wow, that's really pretty scary. You know what what will that mean? And uh, you know, um, letting letting ourselves like letting that little part of us, that young part of us, feel afraid and say, "I'm afraid. I'm scared." Mm-hmm. And then, and then being able to say, "Oh, wow, you know, have some compassion, have compassion for the part of us that's afraid," and mm-hmm. saying, "Yeah, gosh, I bet you're afraid. That makes a lot of sense." And you know, and I, I think we can handle this or whatever it is. But letting yourself really have those conversations uh, mm-hmm. can can be can be helpful. Yeah. Another saboteur element I just want to throw out is um, fear of rejection or abandonment. Mm-hmm. Because often when we are on uh, the verge of some kind of a success or attaining the goal, it implies a change. And that for many of us, there is an unconscious fantasy that we will be in some way unacceptable to the people around us. Mm-hmm. One really powerful part of self sabotage is the fear of envy. Yeah, is definitely. That, exactly. If I. I get the the great big job, and no one in my family has had a job at that oh, level. Absolutely, that I will be then subject to kind of envious attack of one kind or another, or I'll be isolated. You know, I'm the only one with the great big house, and my family won't won't show up. They won't visit me because it's uh, somehow provocative to them that they have less and I have more, mm-hmm. or that literally will be abandoned because we've attained something. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing is that sometimes that actually happens. Oh, absolutely. So we've seen it (laughs) maybe in other people's lives. Yeah. Or we've experienced trying to negotiate that in very small ways leading up to what might be a really substantive success that we're on the verge of. Being an object of envy is a very painful, scary thing. But but again, I think that kind of uh, l- like bringing it to consciousness, then at least we know what we're dealing with. Exactly. There's a yeah. way out of it. Yeah. But, but the, the inner saboteur, again, it can be the one who thinks that they are the inner protector. Yeah. That definitely. they don't think they're sabotaging you. Mm-hmm. They think they're trying to pull you out of the highway because you're about to get hit by the envy right. of a bunch of people, right. which is going to be annihilating. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, one of the things that we haven't brought up is uh, self-sabotage and dreams. And I, I think mm-hmm. there's a couple of relevant things here. One is that the way that we self-sabotage may be shown to us in dreams. So our, our tendency to kind of always get in our own way may, may be one of the things that dreams could show us. Uh, I'm just trying to up with a, a good example but joseph you had the experience where the, the dream offered the medicine to your self-sabotage and you kept on shooting him in the head <laughs> right. right it was break often in nightmares yeah the solution is pursuing us which may right. not necessarily be the solution to self-sabotage but it could very well be mm-hmm. 
the, the thing that's hunting us in the street or breaking into the house or the thing roaring at us initially, the monster, mm -hmm. is the thing that we, we won't know, can't know, refuse to know, mm -hmm. and yet is the medicine yeah. that we need, which and, is true for me. Mm -hmm. I yes. needed some just very salty advice on you know, surviving in a difficult world. These these chase dreams of something pursuing us, or you know, mm. something is rustling in the woods, something is coming up the stairs. Um, you know, I think almost everybody has had a, a dream like that. And the the other category of dreams, I think that almost everybody has had are school dreams. Of I'm in high school or college or anywhere, <laughs> and I'm driving to school. Uh, I've had this dream. I'm driving to this school, and it's the exam. And then all of a sudden, I go, "Oh my God! I didn't. E I totally forgot to <laughs> take the class. I ne I never even. How could I have done that? And my dream ego is in in a dither, scrambling for a parking space. And then I realize oh, I I don't even know what room the class is in. Mm -hmm. I can't even show up for the exam and hope to somehow wind my way through it because I have no idea where the class is. And then that it's at that point with these multiple iterations of um, not being able to, you should pardon the pun, make the grade, um, that I wake up mm -hmm. and go, ah! and the question is, well, where in my life is this happening? Uh, what is this dream symbolizing? And uh, all kinds of people have had this dream of uh, not succeeding uh, at a required class or a, requir a job requirement. You're going to be promoted. It's the party. <laughs> You're dressed in jeans and flip flops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are a million variations. One more thing I just want to toss out. I know we're finishing up soon. Um, is that one of the self saboteur uh, dynamics can can be caused by the the too good mother or the too good father? Yes, ah. and that it's so pleasurable to be in that child complex, it's so pleasurable to receive the support and care mm. from, from another, which could literally be the parents, but sometimes it's a parental substitute, but it's so yummy, mm. and that if we were to take a big step upward, um, becoming more successful in one way or another, mm -hmm. that would also carry an expectation that we are now increasingly independent, that we are now a self-feeding system. And that means that we'd have to give up something that might have been intensely pleasurable. Or at least us. comforting. At the very or least feel comforting. Safe. Right. Yeah. yeah. So independence uh, or, or uh, of sabotaging independence, yeah. we get tension, support. It's at the cost of personal growth. Yes. But sometimes that milk is yeah. so sweet yep. that it's we don't know how to get off the teat, so to speak. Yeah. You know, I th I'm really, really glad you brought that up because I, I think that, that that is a real dynamic that we see pretty often. And uh, yeah, that it, that it feels, uh, you know, I, I know someone who, uh, you know, um, if you ask him to unload the dishwasher, he will make sure he does it wrong so that you never ask him to do it again. And some of us can live our lives like that. You know, where we, we, we make sure that we're never very competent so that not much is ever asked of us. Yeah. I also think that um, graduations are, are part of this. If, then there you are, um, regardless of what kind of background or parenting. Chances are you had a roof over your head and, and meals on the table. And now, it's a wonderful thing. Congratulations. Here's mm -hmm. your diploma. 
and off you go, whether it's high school, college, graduate school, PhD. <laughs> um, and it's like, I don't know how to navigate this. Um, and I, I've known a couple of PhD uh, people where they, you're in the alma mater, the, yeah. all, the all good or beneficent mother. And then there is the, you know, it's a harder world of, and what exactly are your job prospects? And the world is big and we are small and it activates exactly that complex of, this is scary, which I personally think is the the root of self-sabotage. And the question is, what are you scared of? And to be, as you said, Lisa, to be curious, to just get interested in that. Mm -hmm. And this comes back to, Lisa, your suggestion about active imagination, that sometimes in that deep meditative state, we have to call into the darkness and be like, who's scared in there? Right. Or or who's right. hiding? Right. So yeah, who's hiding? Jump out and, and scare me in, in mm-hmm. one way or another. Yeah, and it's important to not go in there and say, all right, who's been fucking up my plans? That's not the right attitude. The right <laughs> attitude is, hey, who's in there? What's yeah. going on? I really yeah. want to hear. Or, or what I sometimes say is, it's great if you can have a friendly attitude. Yeah. It's really great. But if you can't, at least you can say, okay, we need to sit down. We need to get it on. Come on. Talk to me. Show me what you got. Spit it out. Let's deal. Yeah. Of a matter of fact, attitude can be perfectly okay. But but it but y- you want to be open to learning from that other part. Like the exactly. ego attitude actually yes. might be wrong, even if even if there are things you have to do, like stop eating yeah. Skittles. Joseph, do you really love Skittles? I do. <laughs> I don't know why, but I I like have they're like crack, you know. Like there's this company that they're crunchy and then they're tangy and then they're sour and they're sweet. And <laughs> I, I, it's so. I'm sure it's a metaphor are, for something. You, but no, I, I think you're just on the payroll. I am on the payroll. <laughs> and there's a link you can click at the bottom to order Skittles from our, <laughs> our affiliate program with Skittles. Um, or, or listeners can send you Skittles at the following address. Oh, my God. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. Yes, thank you. <laughs> no. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, you know, sometimes we, we have to do things. But we should assume that there's some wisdom in that part of us that is causing the sabotage. Sometimes there's a lot. Yes. Sometimes there's, that's where all the wisdom is. And yeah. we really need to get that part. Yeah. But sometimes there's at least a little wisdom there. Or there's always at least a little. But there's and an intelligence yes. in what's happening. It's not, yes. it's not random chaos. Right. right. Exactly. There's a secret order yeah. to our and, suffering. And, Yes. And so what, what is that? What is that other thing that we, that we need to know mm-hmm. uh, from this part of us that doesn't have, have other words to speak? And so it's just throwing, uh, throwing a wrench in the works for us, or a shoe, as it were. Right. Those wooden shoes. The last thing I just wanted to toss out, um, which is, which is a, I think, a sadder piece of um, the inner saboteur, is that it's highly correlated with a disorganized attachment style. Mm. Mm-hmm. So for those, I know attachment styles have gotten a lot of interest and in, um, you see all kinds of stuff on TikTok and YouTube about attachment styles right now. So a disorganized attachment style happens when the baby is caught between um, being anxiously attached, which is feeling abandoned, and wanting wanting to be soothed, wanting more from the caregiver. And then the dismissive attachment style, which is when the caregiver actually does show up, the experience that the child has is is often enough negative. So maybe they get fed, but they get fed in a way that feels bad. Or maybe they get scolded for crying. So they're crying out because they have a lot of need, but when something arrives to meet the need, 
they pull away because they're not sure if it's, if it's going to wind up feeling bad. Mm-hmm. So when that becomes universalized, it catches us in a kind of impossible tension that I really want the new job, but when the new job arrives, it's going to probably make me feel miserable. Mm-hmm. And that can be um, something that's established very, very early. The advantage, perhaps, if it's true that this is based on the attachment style, we can find this similar dynamic played out in many, many circumstances. Mm-hmm. And instead of attributing it to the job, or attributing it to the disappointing restaurant, or mm-hmm. the, the third person that disappointed you on the date, or the multiple relationships that I shied away from, by placing it in this confusion in the early childhood, sometimes that can liberate us because we realize that it's a kind of phantom that we be- continue to distribute in circumstances where it no longer applies. Mm-hmm. I'm not a baby. I can get my needs met, and I can even make sure that the thing that I take in is in fact really pleasurable for me. I'm not going to be subject to awful experiences in many circumstances that I fear it, Mm -hmm. and that when I'm anxious for contact, I can do something about it. Mm -hmm. I'm not a totally passive passive baby anymore. So sometimes realizing that we're projecting that really early struggle can remind us that we have choices now we could not have possibly had mm. when we were four months old. Yeah. And that can be, over time, very freeing. Yeah, that's a great point. I think some of it, too, is uh, you know, just very, very human. That if I, you know, if I succeed at this, um, I'm just going to get more. Yeah. Uh, and then after I do that, I'm going to get more. And then more, so I will have householding responsibilities and parental responsibilities and work responsibilities and the list of of burdens and responsibilities and duties and musts just grows and grows and grows. Mm -hmm. And I think some of there there's a legitimate protest about you know wait a minute Um, you actually can have. Uh, satisfactions in in life. And just what you were saying, Joseph, there's something you can do about it. There are decisions you can make. Um, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, somehow, um, you know, just getting on a train of uh, responsibilities and duties and an ever-increasing uh, load. Of life is supposed to be on the whole, it is supposed to have goodness mm-hmm. and rewards, mm-hmm. and um, it won't just be uh, one task after another. And I think when we're dealing with this very deep, deep part of the psyche, and I think Freud had this nailed when he talked about the pleasure principle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> One of the things when we approach certain changes and possibilities is that we're having a hard time sensing that the attainment will be pleasurable. And just that one piece that I think that if we can gain some legitimate sense of the pleasure that is possible or likely in the new thing, Mm we might be able to free up a little crack, a little place to slip through and and grant ourselves the pleasurable new thing. Mm -hmm. And often when we're self-sabotaging, the possibility that the new thing will be pleasurable is very far away from us. That's a really great, that's a really great point. I think that's helpful. So yeah, maybe even let yourself enjoy it in the imagination. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of let yourself have a fantasy about it, really enjoy it and taste its sweetness and know that you can get there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Our dreamer today is 24 years old. She is a woman who's a former consultant and an aspiring artist. And the title of her dream is My Husband's Ex-Girlfriend. And here's the dream. I meet with my husband's ex-girlfriend, who he has no contact with in real life. We are cordial with each other. She asks me if I am envious, and I say that I envy my husband's childhood. He was free to pursue his interests and speak his mind. I ask her if she is sad about breaking up with my husband, and she says they're just friends. Later, she and her aunt try to kill my husband and I by tricking us to take an Uber to an empty field. We thought we were going to a restaurant, but the Uber driver has been co-opted into their plan. The ex-girlfriend and the aunt smile innocently at us, and we realize we are tricked. For context, she says, I recently got married and transitioned careers from a consultant to an aspiring artist. Both me and my husband's ex-girlfriend are creative people who grew up with extremely controlling mothers. The main feelings in the dream, she says, I feel relaxed, then naive, then terrified, like there were dark forces at play which I had no idea how to understand. And for additional context, she says, My husband's ex-girlfriend was an accomplished artist, but gave up her dream when her mother stopped her. I rebelled against my mom as a teenager and am only now beginning my creative journey. My husband has frequently remarked on the similarities of temperament and upbringing, both immigrant families in the United States. You know, one of the things that strikes me right off the bat is uh, when we recorded our bonus content uh, this week, which you can access if you're a patron, we had this beautiful dream that was just like a perfect anima dream. Yeah. And this is just a, a really good example of a shadow dream. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's the, the thing that jumps out to me is we have, you know, kind of a classic configuration here. We have Possibly the animus figure and her husband, although it could also be, uh, you know, a dream that has some validity on the objective level, something about her actual relationship with her husband. But but if we're looking at it archetypally, the husband might be an image of animus and the ex-girlfriend is an image of shadow. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's interesting that they're alike because that is usually the case with the shadow. <laughs> I mean, one of the versions of shadow is kind of a doppelganger. So this ex-girlfriend is kind of a doppelganger. And, well, I, I'm going to stop there and, and let you guys run with it. Um, but I'm sure I'll circle back. Well, I think that, the, to me, that the, the key in the dream is all about envy. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And just absolutely. how powerful and problematic envy is and envy of the husband frankly. So I would imagine that the aunt and the ex-girlfriend are representing that envious part of her psyche and, and really bringing it into consciousness in such a powerful way that envy has such a murderous dimension to it. It can kill our <laughs> good feelings towards our spouse. It can, it can kill off the sense that we have anything good inside ourselves. It is such a terrible spoiling energy in it, and, and it seems like the, the unconscious really wants the dreamer to understand just how, how negative and how destructive envy can be, and I suppose if that can be integrated, there might be a strong motivation to kind of get to the root of that maybe make some progress or bring it into consciousness at the very least. I think there is envy of the dreamer, uh, at least in the dreamer's imagination, of the ex-girlfriend. Uh, the ex-girlfriend was an accomplished artist. 
but gave up her dream when her mother stopped her. And our dreamer says, I was rebellious. And she is now transitioning careers to become an artist, which can feel transgressive. Uh, If you've grown up in a family where uh, the emphasis might have been on doing practical um, income-earning pursuits, uh, that's what it takes. And now our dreamer is pursuing her artistic dream, which is uh, psychologically somewhat transgressive, Um, even though becoming an artist is hardly transgressive in and of itself. And that now in the psyche, the shadow figure uh, is there feeling, feeling envious of the dream ego. Uh, as well as the husband who grew up in a supportive family. He was free to pursue his interests. And so the the punishment is not only the ex-girlfriend, but together with her aunt, there are two female figures who are uh, tricking them to abandon them. You know, it feels like um, a Hansel and Gretel story of the aunt the the ex-girlfriend and the aunt are taking them out into the woods, as it were. I I really had a different take on on this dream, actually, oh. than either of you. Okay. Uh, I mean, first of all, I, I will say just just kind of I don't know, for a little framing. Um that that situation where we're we're interfered with pursuing our interests as a as a young person can be very difficult and even tragic. But there are sometimes ways where it works paradoxically, where because our parents were like, no, you'll not be an artist, that that fires us up even more. Or or we we Mm. we come to it with a with a sort of vigor that we might not have had if they'd been like from the time we were four, like, oh, you're so talented, you know. So I just want to say, like, like sometimes things are just in general, not that straightforward. But in specifically in the dream, here's here's what I see is, you know. Shadow figures usually bring something forward that we're not quite conscious of. And so it's always a bit of a challenge to the ego. And in this dream, the the dream ego thinks she's being taken to a nice restaurant. Mm -hmm. She thinks it's going to be this kind of comfortable experience. Right. But instead, she's taken to an empty field. Where she's going to have to work to make anything happen. Yes. Maybe where she's (laughs) going to have to work. There's going to be some kind of... um, You know, the idea of an empty field, it's like, wow, you know, an empty sheet of paper or, you know, I mean, she thinks she's being killed, but as you like to point out, just if there's actually no evidence of that, there's no, you know, it's not like someone's there with a chainsaw. I mean, they're just taken to an empty field. And by the way, I think the Uber driver is a super interesting character, right? Because he's this slightly, you know, kind of nefarious, but indistinct figure who's driving her. So we just talked about Mm -hmm. self-sabotage. What's driving her to the empty field? And what is she going to learn there? Because I think the shadow is bringing her there for a confrontation. She thinks that she's going to have a certain kind of experience. And, you know, she's 24. To transition to a full-time artist at 24, that's like, wow, you know. Maybe she thinks she's going to have a certain kind of experience. But really the unconscious is saying, oh, no. It's going to be something else. It may be something else really quite wonderful, but it's not exactly mm-hmm. what you think. And it may not be as um, m- sort of on the surface pleasant as a nice restaurant. It might be much more important than that. Right. So that's, that's sort of what I was getting from the dream. No, mm-hmm. I think you're there. I think that for her, being an artist is in some way, she thought, related to kind of being the divine child. Right. That she's going to be fed right. delicious food, just right. like her husband was supported. She has some idealistic view of mm-hmm. him receiving all this wondrous support. And again, she envies being the divine child. She hopes she'll be returned to that. Yeah. And then she mm-hmm. discovers, as we always do, particularly in the adult world, it's, just, it's a lot of work, a lot of disappointment being uh-huh. a commercial artist. And it's a big blank canvas, like you said not a cushy five-star Michelin restaurant. <laughs> it's an empty field. And by the way, here's a hoe. 
<laughs> and here's a plow, and we'll come back in a year and see what you can grow. And that yeah. feels like death to the ego. Absolutely. And the death ego to has the its plan of how it's going to go. It, you know, it ties in so well with what we were talking about as ambivalence. Yes. Of what if the dream comes true? You got right. your dream, and right. now you're an artist. And I, I like the analogy between the empty field and uh, the blank uh, piece of paper or a canvas on an easel of that everything will be coming from you, mm-hmm. of your own generative uh, powers and creativity, and that uh, dealing with those feelings of like, hey, yikes. Um, now what do I do? And I, and I definitely think that there's something here about the negative mother, um, because uh, that is a major thing that she has in common right. with mm-hmm. this other woman. And so somehow part of what has to be confronted or dealt with is this, is this, is this negative mother that y- you think you've dealt with because you were rebellious in your teen years or whatever. But, but really, she may be operating in there still in a way that's affecting you and, and your ability. And so it might be that you're going to go out to this field and, yeah, you're going to have a confrontation with this kind of, and an aunt is, you know, sort of a relative to the mother, maybe. So maybe that's kind of a mother figure. So it could be a bit of a Cinderella thing. Mm. It's like uh, you think <laughs> you're going to the ball and you want to go to the field. And it's like, you know, scrub the fields here. We weed 10 acres by tomorrow or else, you know, we're going to kill you. So there is, um, it, and it is possible that that's a, a vestigial memory that when she did want to be creative or she wanted freedom to pursue things, mm-hmm. it's possible that her mother would kind of sweep in and say, well, you know, that's silly. So you should be over here and doing your chores, let's say. And so there can be a kind of um, Protestant work ethic that can weave itself into a childhood where play is seen as somehow highly negative. Yeah, enjoyment. And industrious is the only really good thing. Mm-hmm. And, and that can definitely put the kibosh on a creative spirit, which, by the way, the creative spirit is something that Jung wrote about and, and did identify very explicitly with the divine child. You know, what's coming up for me around the mother stuff, though, is, is something maybe a little more subtle, because if somehow being an artist is about um, rebelling against mom, that's not uh, enough of a place for it to come from. Sure. So part of, part of manifesting this life as an artist might be... Um, uh, coming to terms with what was there with mom and kind of putting that to bed, which is you know not an easy task, especially when we're 24. We're still often working a lot of that stuff out. But it's like, yeah, mom wasn't very supportive, but I, I really don't need to let that stop me. Like it doesn't have to be about that anymore, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's that's sort of my the thing that my my imagination is playing with. But um, yeah, it's a really interesting dream. There's that feeling, the rebelling, and what um, we talked about earlier about envy uh, versus being able to relax a little bit into the enjoyment that was perhaps transgressive um, in childhood, as you were saying, Joseph. No, no, no. You know, come over here and get cracking on, on some chores. But uh, to really uh, appreciate and affirm and that it is okay, Uh, those inner sensors don't have to be there any longer, and you can have and enjoy the good thing. It's very hard to relax and enjoy the good thing if you've been told it's transgressive. Of uh, there's a lot of inner doubt, and is it really okay? And sometimes guilt, which we haven't folded into the mix yet. Of you know, I'm the one that has the things that my family of origin never had. They had it hard. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Life is supposed to be hard. Mm-hmm. And now my life isn't. And am I being disloyal to my family of origin? And yeah. there's, a, there's a lot that can come up before you can say to yourself with a whole heart of, wow, I, 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 I'm on a wonderful, rewarding, generative path, and I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.